To start, I want to admit, and if it's appropriate, um, apologize for the fact that the following does not meticulously coincide with the abstract provided. Um, it begins from the same place and involves numerous of the same concerns, but it meanders a bit and then pauses or maybe gets stuck um, fairly early in its trajectory um, and sort of lingers or mucks about in order, I hope, to raise a few questions and gesture toward a hypothesis or two which may seem relevant for our groups and these symposia's common concerns and without trying to do more um, than I hope successfully to do in the time provided. So by the same place, I mean the undersea or more particularly underwater at South Solitary Island off the north coast of New South Wales with gray nurse sharks, the IUCN designates them vulnerable, um, and untold others, most of those others unseen on a cloudy day. I provide this picture first of all because it makes me think, among other things, about sharky looking, seeing, interpreting, and thinking, activities that have been variously at work in, in the, the, these week's symposia, and which I'll come back to later. And I also provide the picture to acknowledge one of the ways that this research is, in Eve Sedgwick's phrase, psychologically, affectively motivated. Um, motivated, I mean, by an important personal, and so positioned and contingent relationship to the underwater, and by the desire to imagine ways of making my work useful somehow for places and neighbors like this one and these. Um, I also want to say something about my disciplinary and, and methodological composition to give you a fuller sense of whence this paper comes um, and to perhaps provide a context for its investments, errors, and omissions. My PhD training took place in an English department in the United States um, and primarily addressed 17th and 18th century English and British, Irish and French literatures while engaging histories of aesthetics sciences, above all natural history, environments, and empires in kind of pertinent settings. And the work that led me to Australia, which Sophie mentioned before, and work that has continued here, involves poetic and aesthetic histories and increasingly futures of seascape and the submarine. More specifically, I've been attempting to attend to the ways that oceans have provoked critical contention and formal and generic experimentation for writers in the periods and places I've mentioned. So for example, I've been interested in the ways that poets um, take conventions like the pastoral, underwaters, and in how artists and aesthetic theorists mobilize frameworks like picturesque landscape to render the surfaces of seas. Not infrequently, and perhaps not surprisingly, these come to resemble, um, among other things, instances of a kind of marine frontierism um, a subject we heard Sue talk really incisively about in other contexts yesterday. They are implicated, in other words, in forms of what Carrie Bistrom, Isabel Hoffmeyer, and others have recently called hydrocolonialism. As well as these intrications, the literary experiments and immersions I've been working with are notable for staging strange occurrences in representative practices where more or less terrigenous modes encounter another element and other lives. And more often than I'd expected, they provoke anxious and garrulous condemnation from critics concerned with the viability of saltwater imaginings. So I think these matters inflect historical narratives of environmental poetics and aesthetics in the West in numerous important ways. My presentation today departs from some of those inflections. Variety is practically everywhere at issue in the materials I've been engaging over the past couple of years, mostly insofar as oceans are characterized by an alleged extreme lack of variety, an essential sameness, and much more occasionally insofar as oceans are described as copiously or overwhelmingly furnishing variety in contexts that are now sometimes gathered under the sign of the European Enlightenment, variety, I'm saying, mattered a lot for theories of poetic and aesthetic composition, tasteful discernment, and, not coincidentally, correct nature. 
This is just one emblem of what I mean. The title page of William Hogarth's The Analysis of Beauty, written with a view of fixing the fluctuating ideas of taste from 1753. A pictured pyramid contains a serpentine line, which Hogarth called the line of grace, and which represented, he wrote, composed variety, which referred synecdochally to the ontology of beauty. So thanks to the work of scholars like Beth Tobin and Shafali Rajamanar, I've been better able to understand how a poetic and aesthetic concept like variety, when mobilized as a compositional virtue, makes meaning and takes place in the context not only of literature and art, but of scientific voyaging and of colonialism. Tobin, for example, shows the ways that practices of natural history and practices of poetics and aesthetics interacted in Hogarth's era and after, to delineate a cohesive and multiply commoditable spectacle of tropical landscape, one defined above all by natural variety and the kind of false projection of an absence of human labor. Such spectacles extend their influence in Richard Grove's influential account of the historical entanglements of European imperialism and modern conservationism where the tropic symbolic power appears constitutive of the desires and orientations of Western environmentalism. And I take these things to have been at issue already in some of the papers that we've heard today. So somewhat more recently, in a book called American Tropics, the historian Megan Rabi has argued persuasively that what she calls modern biodiversity discourse be understood as having emerged from highly contingent places, times, politics, and configurations. The ideas, attitudes, and institutions forged at field sites in the colonies and neo-colonies of the Circum-Caribbean, she writes, are crucial for understanding of the emergence of this new paradigm, she writes, which is to say biodiversity, in biology and conservation at the end of the 20th century. So one among Rabi's many objects of study is Alfred Russell Wallace, who some of us will be familiar with, the English naturalist and evolutionist whose tropical nature from 1878 is especially preoccupied by the tropics' stunning variety and attempts to explain that variety by reckoning those regions represent some more ancient world than do others. And this emplacement of biodiversity's intellectual history makes me think, furthermore, of the works of writers like Jamaica Kincaid, who in A Small Place from 1988 drew such critical connections among the legacies of British colonialism and the construction of, in Kincaid's case, Antiguan nature for the consumption of foreign tourists. In a recent paper, called A General Model for Biodiversity and Its Value, Dan Faith, senior principal research scientist at the Australian Museum Research Institute, identifies variety as biodiversity's core value and suggests that, 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 that the genealogy, excuse me, as it were, of that value has been insufficiently reckoned. So Faith, Faith makes this claim about, about variety being a core value, but I want to stress that he's not doing this kind of uncritically. The relations among Faith's claim and the histories and situations I've mentioned, as well as more besides, comprise the stuff I've been trying to engage as I think my way toward a research question and a project that contributes to understanding these intersections in ways that might be useful for colleagues and might be useful for the ethical works I understand our multi-species justice group to be engaged in. A research question, I mean, that in a very rudimentary form might look something like what poetic and aesthetic histories operate in discourses, theories, and practices of biodiversity? Or somewhat more pithily, what are the poetics and aesthetics of biodiversity? I'm aware that neither of these questions include the words multi-species or justice, and I'm not wanting to simply take for granted that they are at stake within them, but I think they are, um, and it'd be wonderful to hear whether, where, and how you appreh apprehend them. <laughs>
So when I consider the movements of a paper like this, I become concerned about the potential for an inquiry like mine to rather ironically reproduce some of the currents it is undertaking to understand and to a meaningful extent to critique. I'm wary, on the one hand, of thinking and writing a teleological story about biodiversity, one that under understands its contemporary workings as the various outgrowths of poetic and aesthetic ideals robust enough to transmit themselves down times and across places. And I'm wary, on the other hand, of tacitly affirming one contingent, if dominant, form of biodiversity as the concept's essential form, as though its triumph over other forms, theories, and practices of biodiversity were something to be taken for granted. And these apprehensions, which I don't misrecognize as, as exhaustive, take me toward another imperfect way of posing a question, towards something like, how do poetics, aesthetics, and biodiversities mutually relate? So bearing these caveats along, <clears throat> I nonetheless suspect it's, it's worth trying to comprehend how biodiversity discourse issues from imperial cultures, partly because doing so may help clarify how power is inscribed and exercised through it in policy frameworks like UNESCO World Heritage and in sundry conservation contexts many of which I've been learning more about in the past few days. A globalizing form of biodiversity may indeed be at work in such frameworks and in the imaginaries it nurtures and with which it intersects. And as Rabi and others propose, this may be something that we're insufficiently recognizing. <clears throat> at the same time, I'm uncomfortable with the sense that such recognition may come necessarily to entail a particular and overdetermined kind of critique when persons in the world are so clearly working biodiversity in multiple ways. Um, biodiversity, writes the Potawatomi scholar and scientist Robin Wall Kimmerer, is the imagination of Earth. The poetic and aesthetic energies of a claim like this one are, to my mind, excitingly rich, and I suspect that it would be a frightening nonsense to imply that they are only the work of empire, let alone William Hogarth. Um, moreover, I don't need to go further than the matters we've been mulling in this group and in these symposia to observe other kinds of biodiverse aesthetics in evidence. In How Forests Think, a text that's recurred so much over these past days, Eduardo Cohn posits a perspectival aesthetic, whereby thoughts relate to other thoughts and so selves to other selves by making what he calls provisional guesses about the experiences and worldviews of others. His point, as I take it, is not that this follows the logics of imperial scientific observation and representation, but that it involves polysemous and multi-directional relations that are always already happening and making meaning. This for me is one of the more exciting features of Cohn's book because it offers the rigorous guess, the rigorous imagining, maybe, as a humble means mediated, provisional, fallible, and tenuous, to be sure, of representing other experiences, or perhaps of knowing that such representations are always ongoing and partaking more willfully of that ongoingness. Maybe this is sort of like borrowing from and riffing on the work of Donna Haraway, a theory of sim aesthetics or sim aesthesis one that is always working with and alongside its sympoetic complement. And the reason that I'm saying that this might relate to biodiversity is based on one of the relatively rare moments in Cohn's work when he appears to be making something like a normative aesthetic claim on behalf of the places he's been working. Of the forest, Cohn writes that the interrelations among so many different semiotic life forms in this dense ecology of selves result in a relatively more nuanced and exhaustive overall representation of the surrounding environment when compared to the way life represents elsewhere on the planet. I'm really interested in continuing to hear from colleagues what they make of a statement like this one. I'm probably never not reading tendentiously but this does seem a striking attempt to make an ecological argument on behalf of aesthetic value that does not depend or strenuously tries to avoid depending on taste, spectacle, 
and some of the other energies that I've mentioned already. Interesting to me, however, is that it does seem to depend on something like variety. In my reading, the poetics, so to speak, of Cohn's claim entails that the more and the more different aesthetic perspectives an ecology affords, the better it represents and the more remarkable it is. And this sounds to my inexperienced ear like another way of imagining biodiversity. But crucially, as an ecology of various interacting aesthetic subjects as opposed to an ecology of various aesthetic objects. I've been trying to understand the implications of this for poetic and aesthetic representation. And that's been a useful trying for thinking about, for instance, the marine biologist David Gruber's shark eye and turtle eye cameras which attempt to partly approximate the aesthetic experiences of some sharks and sea turtles by representing bioluminescence, biofluorescence, and other phenomena that are ordinarily unavailable to human sensoria. This sort of thing can read like the progressive co-optation of shark and turtle views, as though enlightenment were marching on and underwater. But it's interesting to me that Gruber seems to regard his cameras as a bit like Cone's guesses. This work, he explains, forces us to take a step out of the human perspective and start imagining the world through a shark's perspective. Perhaps, thinking with Cohn, Gruber, and others at once, this sort of thing does not widen the human aesthetic to absorb sharky views so much as to compel human perspectives to avow the existence of a rich and unassimilable thing called a shark self. So to lurch toward an end that isn't a resolution, and I think lurching is the best that I can do today, I'm trying to figure what it means to hold these and other visions of biodiversity alongside one another at once, and to contribute in some small way to imagining what a nuanced and ethical, but probably not exhaustive, biodiversity or biodiversities might mean. What poetics and aesthetics, and whose poetics and aesthetics it and they might express. And passingly, I'll iterate that I have a particular interest in understanding how relations among poetics, aesthetics, and biodiversity take on unusually urgent meanings in marine ecologies, which have, as I mentioned earlier, tended to make unusual demands upon, not to say refuse, poetic and aesthetic practices that sprout, if that's not too easy a metaphor, from ground. And thinking of the many conversations these past days that have invoked the aesthetic, implicitly or explicitly, I'm hopeful that these matters may prove useful for the various thinkings we've all been doing, not least insofar as we've been talking about the need for more and different views, perspectives, orientations, and so forth, as well as the ways we've been discussing models of relating selves that take us beyond dualisms and indeed beyond individuals. Thanks a lot for listening and for any ways you feel like sharing what this may have meant for you. Thanks.